Hello and welcome everyone. My name is James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. We are a sl slow and open newsroom. Our interest is not in adding to the breaking news, but to understand what's driving it. And today we're holding a summit, a summit in the new circumstances we find ourselves in, one that doesn't uh, bring people together physically, but digitally. And so welcome to everyone from uh, all over the world who's joining us today. A particular thank you to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, to Project Everyone and to the One Campaign. Uh, we put this together and we put this together because three, four months ago, we were holding one of our open news meetings, one of these think-ins. And what struck us most was that there'd never been quite a time where there was a need for global leadership and never quite a time where there'd been such little evidence of one. And so what we thought we might do is say, well, the G7 isn't meeting, but the 7 billion people on the planet, if you like, the G7 billion surely needs uh, evidence of leadership and an agenda for leadership. And in that spirit, we thought we would have a go at beginning to articulate one. And I should just say one thing about the way we approach journalism. I said that it's open. We're an open newsroom. We want to be informed by our members, Tortoise members. We want to be informed, of course, by other newsrooms too. I know that there are plenty of other journalists joining us today. Please do weigh in, uh, whether you're a colleague from Tortoise, a member of Tortoise, uh, a journalist in another newsroom, please do weigh in. Um, you can either raise your hand, everyone knows the way around Zoom these days, you can either raise your hand or just put a point in the chat and what I'll do is I'll bring you into the conversation, uh, get the chance to put your point or question directly uh, to the, the speakers through the course of the day. And of course we start this morning with the Chief Executive of AstraZeneca, Pascal Sorio. Pascal, thank you so much uh, for joining us. The reality is we can't really have a conversation about global leadership. We can't have a conversation about what needs to happen next without having a conversation about vaccine development. And um, it's hard to think of anyone better to have that conversation with than you, uh, Pascal. Um, clearly there is a huge amount of interest and an enormous amount riding on the development of a vaccine. I'm gonna encourage people to weigh in and as I say, join you in the conversation as we get going. But why don't you, start if you would by just telling us what we can now reasonably expect a vaccine to do and i suppose more importantly still still when we can expect a vaccine to be available well, thank you james and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you thank you for having me the yeah what could a vaccine uh, do i mean we basically hope that it will be protecting as many people as possible um, the questions that uh, really we have to answer through clinical trials uh, number one, is the vaccine effective, of course? And number two, what kind of protection does it provide? In a sense, does it protect 50% of the people? That's the, min the minimum the FDA in the US has established as a target. Does it, pro pro does it, uh, pro um, sorry, uh, does it cover 60%, 80% of the, uh, the, the people? So that's one question. Of course, older people tend to have an immune system that doesn't respond as well as younger people to vaccines. So this may be a population that is not well protected. That's what we're studying. And the last question is how long? Because if a vaccine mm -hmm. works, um, we will know that in the next few months. The next question will be for how long? Are you protected for three months, which is useful, but not very useful, of course. Are you protected for 12 months? Are you protected for two years or more? And this answer will only come uh, as the trials continue, it will take time to give this final answer. Mm -hmm. Now as to the first question, which is, does it protect people, at least for a period of time? We should know that uh, before the end of the year. And the, the big question that we, and when I say we, I mean the industry, the people developing vaccines are dealing with is what is the, uh, what we call in our uh, industry jargon, the event rate. Um, uh, or the attack the rate. What? Can you say that again? The what, Pascal? The events rate or the attack rate, which is what is the infection rate in the community? How many infections are there in the community? Because you will understand, of course, that in a study, you compare a group of people who are vaccinated to a group of people who are not vaccinated. But if there is no infection in the community, you cannot show the vaccines protecting the vaccinated individuals because there's no infection. And so, and then the, the events, right, the, the number of infections um, of course, influences the speed at which you get to results. 
to be statistically significant, you design the study to, uh, to have to reach a certain number of infections. When you reach this infections, this number of events, which is the same for cancer studies and other studies, then you know you can look at the study and compare the two, the two, uh, the two groups. And so, you know, to accumulate infections, you have, it can happen quickly if there's a lot of infections in a community or it can take a long time. So we're very much at the mercy, in fact, of uh, the infection rate. In the UK, as you know, it declined. It may, grow up, it may go up again, but it has declined the last few months. We also have a study in uh, Brazil where the infection rate has been high, and we have a study in South Africa where the infection rate has been high. So, you know, that basically uh, will define how quickly we get a read out, and it's the same for the studies that are running in the US. So, so, so Pascal, then, I'd like to come to each of those things, some of the points you make about is it 50%, is it 80% efficacy, how long does it work for, and some of the issues too in understanding how effective a phase three trial of 30,000 people is. But everyone's very well aware that AstraZeneca in conjunction with Oxford University is a front runner in the development of a vaccine. And I'm sure most people on call today will have seen that there was a pause this week to, the, to, the, to that phase three trial. Can you just explain what's happened and what it means? Yeah, so the, the, I mean, of course, you're looking at the efficacy of a vaccine in the phase three program. But an important, a very, very important aspect is safety, mm -hmm. uh, because you are going to vaccinate people who are healthy otherwise, and, and you cannot afford. I mean, when, when you're treating cancer patients um, and people are unfortunately about to die, uh, some side effects are more tolerated. But if you're vaccinating healthy people, side effects, of course, are not tolerated. So you have to be very prudent, very careful as you run your trial. So essentially, the process is always the, in vaccines trials that if you have an event um, that you didn't expect, then you stop to look at it and explore it and study it. And that's what happened uh, in our case. But it's really common. In fact, I was reading an article in the Financial Times this morning, and there's a, there's a quote by Jeremy Farrar in this article. Uh, and you may know Jeremy, of course, he's the director of the Wellcome Trust. He were, and he's very experienced in uh, infectious diseases and vaccines, he was saying that um, it is very unusual for a, vaccines for a vaccine trial to not stop like we did. It's very common, actually. And many experts will tell you this. The difference with other vaccines trials is the whole world is not watching them, of course. So they stop, they study, and they restart. Mm -hmm. So it, what happened here is not uncommon. P Pascal, to be honest, I, the more I looked into this yesterday, the more confused I was in that on the one hand, as you say, there are people like Jeremy Farrer of Welcome saying, look, it's very standard that you pause a trial. Someone was saying, look, there is some evidence that some evidence that there are um, connections between transverse myelitis. I think this is the circumstance that, that, that afflicted this individual, inflammation of the spinal cord and, and vaccinations, not necessarily this specific one. But of course, it sounds like a very worrying condition that. And so, so it's hard for us to read how significant it is. I, I appreciate that pauses are routine, but, but having looked at it more closely, how significant a delay, how significant a concern do you think that this particular issue is? Yeah, so, so I have to, first of all, uh, correct the statement, actually, James. We don't know if it is a transverse malitis. Oh, I see. Uh, there are more tests that are being done on the patient, on the person who developed those symptoms. And, uh, you know, it's complicated, of course, and it, you have to take a number, you have to do a number of tests and you have to take time. And when this is all finished, the physicians will, uh, of course, share the data with the, uh, the safety committee. In a trial like this, you establish uh, a committee of experts that you call the DSMB, it's an independent safety committee. They are independent from the company, but they're also independent from the trial sponsors in that instance, uh, Oxford University. And they review the data and they, and they make a determination. Mm -hmm. So that process has to unfold before we can conclude what it is. So we don't know what the final diagnosis is and we should really keep this in mind. Now, as to TM itself, transverse malitis, it is a very rare event. So you will find people saying, you know, it's correlated, other people it's not correlated. correlated. And it's very hard because, because it's a rare event. Um, essentially, you cannot determine fully 
So the experts are probably debating this, whether it's related or not. Uh, what is true is that you will see transverse myelitis mentioned in the product information of several other vaccines. And the problem is, uh, it's not a problem, but the issue with vaccine is you act actually vaccinate thousands and thousands of people. So you will see all sorts of issues come up that are often not related to the vaccine. And just like events that were gonna happen anyway, uh, because they happen, I mean, people fall sick, people develop all sorts of symptoms. So what you have to do there is compare over time, the vaccinated arm and the control arm, and to see whether you have more event, more safety events in one than the other. And if you look again at many vaccine trials, you will see they have quite a lot of uh, what you would call adverse events, but in fact, when they compare the control arms and the, the treatment arm, they basically are the same because people will develop uh, some of these conditions and you will see that if you vaccinate tens of thousands of people, of course. You're on mute, James. Uh, sorry, I was uh, mute. That's largely, as we were talking, as we were saying, Pascal, before we started, the excitement I've got here is, uh, is a very overexcited dog. So I decided that so that we could understand how this was working, <laughs> I mute myself. Um, Pascal, what are we talking about in terms of the scale of a pause? Is this a matter of days, weeks, months? Yeah, this is another question that we cannot answer. And, and, and I, look, I do realize people have lots of questions and mm. believe me, I would like to have the answers for ourselves to start with. Yes. But we have to be patient with these things and we have to do the right thing and we have to follow the process as it is established. And the process, as I said, is... Um, a full workup on this person is being done. The, the, the physicians, the experts will basically analyze this. It's gonna be submitted to the independent safety committee. And then basically we will know, uh, the safety committee will tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we hope that in the end, of course, the sequence will be like it often is, like the safety committee tells you, you can restart the study, but they may also reach a different conclusion and we have to accept that. I mean, the, the decision is in their hands and uh, there's nothing we can do to learn more until basically the whole process has unfolded. Well, all right, Pascal, I think that we'll probably want to understand more about the phase three trial, but actually um, Andrew McConaughey's sort of raised a question fr from the start about whether or not this pause itself is helping us reframe our thinking about speed and safety. A Andrew, do you want to put the point to Pascal? I don't know if Andrew is on mute. I can't hear. Uh, there he is. I think he's there. Uh, Andrew, if you can let your put your camera on, that would be great. There you are. You're on mute. Well, Andrew. I still can't hear you, Andrew. Forgive us. There you are. No, we, now we can. There we go. Yes, great. Thanks for taking my question. Um, it's just a question about uh, whether we've got to the stage where talking about um, speed and a race to developing these vaccines has become perhaps somewhat unhelpful. Uh, particularly from the general public's perspective, but also for the ordinary uh, process of drug development, which the uh, general public aren't familiar with. Um, and maybe that will help reset our expectations uh, about timing. Well, I, I think that, uh, I mean, speed and uh, proper process and safety can be combined. Now, the one thing you cannot compromise, it's safety. And that's why we have a very robust process in place. This is why we stopped enrollment in that study because we really want to make sure that our safety process is respected and uh, it's really really important but you can combine safety with some level of speed and the way you do this is you have to apply a different process and different usually pharmaceutical companies work on a vaccine or new medicines they accumulate data clinical trials data and then they submit the whole package to the regulators and it takes a long time to accumulate this data and then the regulators take uh, a few months to review this. So here we're doing this in parallel. We're talking to the regulator on a regular basis. We're sharing our data as we go. You could not do this for every single vaccine or, or, or drug because the system would not be supporting it. Uh, the regulator uh, would not have the resources, the company, they would not work. But for this one, you can do it. The other thing you can do is parallel track the development and the manufacturing. So you start manufacturing the, the vaccine uh, before you know the results of the clinical trial. Now, of course, the risk you run here is you're going to waste money because if the vaccine doesn't work, 
then this manufacturing has been done, you know, for nothing really. But, and it's a financial risk, but when you see the impact of this disease on the world from a health viewpoint, but also from an economic viewpoint, the few hundred million dollars that are invested at risk, I think are well, uh, well worth uh, financial risk. But, you know, this is how you do it, uh, but safety cannot be compromised. So, so uh, Pascal, thank, thank you, and uh, Andrew, thank you too. The, the, there are a number of people who've um, got their hands up. I'm going to come, if I can, in a moment to Rani Das, um, and, uh, and I see that Julian Deutsch has got a question. The, the, one of the things that happens as a result of this, Pascal, is I imagine there's a, there's a level of public scrutiny as well as professional and industrial scrutiny of what you're doing that hasn't happened before. And so you have people like me who don't really understand vaccine development or trials suddenly running a slide rule over the way the industry operates and so one of the things that struck me as sort of worrying i suppose is that a phase three trial as i understand it is conducted with thirty thousand people which as you say may work if you're developing a treatment for people who are sick but if you're going to vaccinate potentially seven billion people or a good proportion of those Presumably 30,000 is too small a sample to pick up all of the unintended consequences of a vaccine. And I wonder how you think about the, the trial process and the safety process in this very specific context. Yeah, first of all, James, in our case, the, uh, the, 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 the size of the study, of the program, I should say, mm. is going to be more like 50 to 60,000 uh, right. people vaccinated when we are finished. That's the normal size of a vaccine uh, trial, a vaccine development program. Um, and then, so already you have 50 or 60,000 people and you're, with this, you're gonna pick up very rare events. Um, but beyond that, I think the governments have programs or plans to vaccinate the population over a period of time. They're not gonna vaccinate everybody. And because vaccines will not be available for everybody on day one. Every manufacturer mm -hmm. is, is uh, spinning up the manufacturing process, but uh, you know, we will not have the capacity, even as an industry collectively, to supply the hundreds of millions of doses that are necessary. We won't be able to supply this uh, you know, uh, in the first few months. So the governments will have to prioritize populations and probably they'll, they'll prioritize population at risk or healthcare workers. And then over time you, you expand it. So it's not going to be like you vaccinate the entire population on day one. So, 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 so even the the fifty to sixty thousand, do you feel confident that that's enough people? Typically, it's enough in a vaccine program. Yes. Um, okay. And honestly, well, if you look at the product information of uh, many other vaccines, you will see that uh, what you see in the product information is typically the adverse events that have been uh, reported in the clinical program, and then you see a sort of a real life pharmacovigilance at various events that were reported later. But you have, in the clinical program, you see a whole range of adverse events that you also see in the control arm, by the way, because uh, I mean, what is called an adverse event, but it, it, actually, it actually can be related to the vaccine or it could just be something that happens to people. Um, mm -hmm. So out of 50 or 60,000 people, you pick up, you know, what you need to pick up typically. Right. Pascal, I want to bring in some of the tortoise members and I know some of the other re reporters on the call. J Julian Deutsch had a question. I saw uh, uh, Harry Moy had a point, um, Ludwig Berger too. So Julian, do you want to, to kick off? Yeah, thanks so much for, for taking the time to answer my question. Um, I, I was curious, you, know, you reported in stat uh, providing investors with more information about the patient's adverse condition. Um, for example, you also said that there was a patient in July who experienced neurological symptoms, although this was a patient who was later diagnosed with MS that was not related to the vaccine. I'm curious though, you know, by not making this information public, does this allow for rumors and vaccine, vaccine hesitancy to flourish? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. The, the information about the first patient was actually public before I mentioned it yesterday. And yesterday, by the way, this, I know some people have suspected we set up this investors meeting this, the investor meeting yesterday, it's called the, J, the JPM, uh, JP Morgan conference, and they call it the CEO series, which is they invite uh, CEO of pharma companies. And last week, I think it was Roche, next week, I think it's the, the CEO of JSK or uh, 
So, you know, it was planned many, many months ago. In fact, it was planned six or eight months ago. And it's a series of interviews that, uh, or meetings that take place with all the pharma companies. So there was not a specific event. And basically what I said about the first uh, event was a confirmation of what had been communicated before, actually. Julian, thanks so much. Um, uh, Ali Borani, you had a question too, and then as I said, I'm going to come to, to Harry Moy. But, but by the way, typically, what you know, as I said, this uh, when you pause, and again, I would like to send you back to this comment Jeremy Farrar made about it's very unusual to don't, to not pause. So in fact, it is usual to pause. Well, typically, when you pause, you basically pause the trial, you investigate, and then you restart, unless it is, of course, a big problem, and then you have to stop completely, but uh, will take more time, but otherwise you restart. But, but again, this is uh, something that the company typically manages with investigator group. What we have here is a very special set of circumstances with when the entire world becomes involved in the conduct of the clinical trial and wants to know every step of the way. But the reality is we all have to be very patient and see how it unfolds. And, you know, at the end of the day, we will know at some point whether the vaccine works or, and, and can be used. And if it's safe, we just have to be patient. Yeah. Uh, Pascal, thanks. Th Ali Bogani. Uh, Pascal, thank you for all of your efforts and thank you to James and Tortoise for bringing us all together. Two quick questions. One is that when uh, pharmaceutical companies ask the governments for, um, you know, legal indemnity and uh, nobody can go after them, this sends an unnerving message to the average Joe and anybody out there. So my question is, if it's safe, why would you need that indemnity? Second thing is that wouldn't it for uh, building the confidence, it would be sending a great message if the ministers of health, chief scientists and heads of pharma would take the vaccine first themselves, you know, uh, and leading by example. And then in terms of the distribution yesterday, Yata said you need 8,000 Boeing 747s to take this around the world. My question is around the refugee camps and the mass populations of refugees, where do they stack up in receiving the vaccine if you go out and to the market? Thank you. Yeah. So I have several questions. First of all, I would say that uh, the, this, this indemnification is typical in a situation of pandemic. In fact, it is so typical that uh, it's actually part of U.S. Uh, legislation, U.S. law, where you have, in fact, more than indemnification in the U.S. You had they um, they have even 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 more than the indemnification that you get in uh, in Europe. You get immunity. So indemnification means people can sue you. The government will indemnify you. Immunity means. Uh, you cannot even be sued. People have to sue the government. So it, it's in U.S. law. It's called the PrEP Act, and it's you know it has to be activated by the government, but but it's it's planned in the law. So it's really uh, usual. In our case, we supply this vaccine at no profit, so it's clear that we need partnerships with governments in terms of the manufacturing, but also the uh, the safety. Uh, aspects of the indemnification aspect. The, the, the reason this indemnification exists is not to keep everybody protected from, you know, true side effects. It's really that uh, at the end of the day, you know, when you vaccinate thousands or millions of people, you're going to have people who can sue you, um, even if their lawsuit is not justified. And therefore, you know, having this protection ensures that only the people who do truly deserve to be indemnified are indeed indemnified. Otherwise, companies will be flooded with lawsuits that some of them would be justified, others would not be justified. Um, and it becomes uh, unsustainable. It is not viable. So no company would develop the vaccine. So you know, it's a choice society has to make, right? So, so that's the background of it. In terms of being vaccinated, it's another one where we cannot uh, win because if we get vaccinated, we'll be we'll be, we will be accused to, uh, you know, vaccinating ourselves first. Many of our employees have asked, and of course we can't do this until the vaccine is safe and effective. Mm. But even when the vaccine is safe and effective, if we start with ourselves, people will say, well, you know, you prioritize yourself and not the broader community. So even internally, we have these kind of discussions. 
can we include our own employees or should we wait until um, um, we have? But I can tell you, uh, as soon as the, the program is finished and the, drug, the vaccine is approved, I will be first in line. Um, Pascal, Pascal I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press you, Ali, forgive me for interrupting, so we haven't got to the distribution question, but I just, I realise that we've got about 10 minutes left, I just wanted to press a few things. Yeah. The, the first is, Pascal, just to be clear, you've talked a lot about patience. Um, I heard from a government minister in the UK before the summer, hopes in government circles that you might see an Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine in the market before the end of the year. I suppose we're really clear now that's not going to happen. And so I was just wanted to get a sense from you of the answer to the original question of when you reasonably expect uh, a vaccine in the market. Yeah, first of all, patients. Um, so long term, it's basically, you know, I keep talking about medicines the whole day. And when you talk about medicine, you talk about patients. <laughs> when it comes to vaccines, we should talk about people because those yeah. are healthy individuals, not, not yes. people who are uh, unwell. Um, I think that, I mean, you know, of course, it depends on the outcome of this uh, uh, review. But if the review by the safety committee allowed us to restart the trial, I still think we are on track for having a, a set of data that we would submit before the end of the year. And then, of course, after this, it depends on how fast the regulator will review and give approval. So we could still have a vaccine by the end of this year, maybe early next year. But by the end of this year, it's still feasible. And by the way, there are other, two other vaccines that are actually moving very quickly. One is developed by Pfizer and the other one by Moderna in the US. Those are mRNA vaccines and those are also advancing quite quickly in phase three. So you think that it's, it's feasible for people to, if not expect, at least hope for the distribution of a vaccine in the first half of 2021? I think so, yes. I mean, basically from a manufacturing viewpoint, we would be ready. And if we, again, lots of if, of course, but uh, if we are able to restart the trial, I mean, that, that is a decision the safety committee has to make, of course, but if we did restart, then we still are on track. And I think we can on our, on ourselves deliver before the end of the year, this data. And the same for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. So I think we could have a vaccine. The, the question will be, we won't have a lot of vaccine, of course, because then you have to scale up the capacity and the manufacturing. Right. Well, well let, 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 can we just come to that? What well, one of our partners in this, as I said, Pascal, is the One campaign. And, you know, one of their, their big issues is to make sure that, that we see vaccine equity, a fairness in the distribution of the vaccine. Can you just talk about what's the government's role, what's AstraZeneca's role in how you deal with issues of price, of multilateralism, of... Uh, of fair treatment of, pe of different countries and people within those countries? Yeah, actually it's more than companies and governments, it's also NGOs and for instance, the Bill Gates Foundation is playing a very big role. I mean, they are very generous funding uh, access to vaccines and other medicines. You have uh, other organizations like Sepi Gavi, which by the way, are also funded by Bill Gates. And so it's a collective effort, it's a team effort, if you will. Now. The way we've approached that ourselves is really we need to bring, offer access to everybody as quickly as possible. And so for this, we've done two things. One is we said we will do this at no profit. And two is we said we need to scale up capacity around the world. And, and to do this, we need partners because there's no single company in the industry that, has, that can produce the, the doses of vaccine that are needed by themselves. Nobody, is, nobody has the capacity, even the, the vaccines companies. So we've entered many uh, agreements in India, in Brazil, in Russia, in China, in Japan. Um, and and uh, in Europe, in the US, we are also manufacturing with uh, uh, other companies that are helping us. Uh, so we have a European supply chain, a US supply chain, a supply chain for Latin America, one in, in different geographies. So, so, so are you saying, Pascal, are you saying that we are almost inevitably going to see a repeat of the supply chain problems that we had with PPE, with ventilators, when it comes to uh, vaccine distribution? I don't think so. I mean, in our case, we are really scanning up rapidly and right. we'll be able to supply everybody, every region, more or less at the same time. But the right. only way for us to do this was to partner with a number of other companies, which is what we've done. And the last thing you've got to do, of course, is work with uh, governments 
and NGOs, and, and we have a, a big agreement with CP Gavi to supply our vaccines. And we go back to Adi's question to supply our vaccines to the uh, low middle income countries, including, of course, refugee camps and, and other countries that can't afford that. Yeah. And that will be done through, through Gavi, who will ensure a fair and equitable distribution. Okay, but, but, um, Pascal, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to, if I may, do something slightly unfair to you just in the last few moments, which is, is invite a number of people just to make their points concisely to you. Um, I, I mentioned Harry Moy, who'd raised the information point. I see David Pilling is talking about the trial in South Africa. I said I'd bring in Rani Das to begin with. So can I just ask each of those three to make their points uh, swiftly to, to Pascal, and then Pascal, I'll ask you to answer them uh, all together, if you wouldn't yeah. mind. Um, Harry, do you want to start? Pascal, um, I, was, I was wondering about, in terms of the, the sort of the global distribution, and um, what challenges that you'll be facing, um, and I suppose of the pharmaceutical companies, of the fact that we're approaching, we're now in a world, this sort of populist world, where several of the large nations in the world are very much X-first centric. So they're very much going to be um, focusing on, on their selves as, instead of um, you know, going out. You know, we saw the rumor about Trump and, and the thing in Germany. Um, what challenges are you going to be facing as a company making those um, decisions as to who you're going to be distributing it to? And those sort of forceful um, approaches that they might be taking as well. Harry, thank you. Oh, I mean, Pascal, forgive me. I'm going to invite Rani and David just to make oh, their okay. points and then come back to you. Rani, you just need to unmute. There you are. You're there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. There. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, with regards to collecting data, will there be any data collected after the trial? Um, have been given to people and um, for different age groups who are taking the vaccine so children or um, older people people with health conditions um, will that be taken into consideration and the actual vaccine itself is it uh, obviously is it preventative will it stop the spread um, can the COVID-19, does it lay dormant? I mean, is the vaccine, will it stop the effects? And, and is it something that, you know, that can come back at a later date? And- Ronnie, uh, I can't, I can't Ronnie, I'm gonna stop you there because we won't have time for Pascal to answer all of those questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're, they're, they're all great, they're, they're all great, but there'll be too many. And I'm just going to, but Ronnie, thank you very much. Um, I'm finally gonna bring David Pilling in and, and Ludwig Berger from, um, from Reuters. David, hello. Hi, um, you're trialling the vaccine in uh, South Africa. Um, um, my question is, is there an arrangement in place so that South Africans will get kind of early dibs on any vaccine? I believe you have a similar, you do have an arrangement with Brazil, but how about South Africa? And if not, do you not risk a, 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 you know, a backlash, people saying that they're being you know, used as guinea pigs, which is something that you do here um, uh, around Africa? And how, so how are you dealing with that potential all right, David, thank you very much. By the way, while you were speaking, David, Joe Sorrell from the Gates campaign is applauding you for the piece you did in the, on the FT on eradicating polio and what it tells us about COVID. So oh. everyone do go and, go and read that. Um, and finally, thank Ludwig, you. do you want to just put the, put the point to Pascal and then all the best of luck, Pascal, in answering all of these? Many thanks. Thanks, uh, Pascal. Um, this clinical halt that we're now seeing, was this something you would have published of your own volition even without the stat report? And if so, when are, uh, would you have announced this adverse event maybe only after the safety monitoring board has made a call on a restart on, or a stop just on the timing of things? And, uh, and, and uh, at the risk of getting bogged down in details, I just would love you to clarify whether this indeed was a UK-based woman um, and that she's improving and will likely dis be discharged from hospital or has been discharged, and whether she was indeed part of the active arm of the trial and not the meningitis arm. Thanks. Ludwig, thank you. So, Pascal, there was America First, Data and Generations, South Africa, and transparency around the, um, the halt. Yeah, so maybe uh, Harry's question about distribution is connected to David's question about South Africa. Um, we, we sort of assumed from the beginning that uh, we needed to uh, establish separate uh, supply chain in different geographies because we thought it 
you know, governments could try to protect themselves or their country first, of course. So we have a supply chain in the US, one in Europe, vaccines that will be distributed in Europe, are made in Europe. We even have one for the UK. We have one in Russia, we have one in uh, India, we have one in China, one in Japan, one in uh, Argentina, Mexico for Latin America. So we will be able to supply everybody at the same time. And we've been, uh, we've been lucky to be able to partner with groups like CEPI, Gavi, the Bill Gates Foundation. The Carlos, Carlos Slim Foundation is helping out for Latin America. And so working, all, all working together, we are able to supply every region of the world, more or less at the same time. Right. Um, so I think we want to really provide um, access to uh, everybody around the world at the same, at the same time, because we, will, we are now close to 3 billion doses uh, of vaccines that we could manufacture, and we will not be alone. Uh, other, vaccine, other vaccines will also be out there. Some may be more uh, usable, if I would say, in, 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 in parts of the world than others because of the storage conditions, but over time it may also change. So when you combine all the vaccines that are the, the most advanced ones, I think there will be enough vaccines for everybody. The question is not there in my mind. The question is whether they work or not. And we will know that soon. Hopefully, I mean, we all keep our fingers crossed. We know soon whether they work and whether they are safe. And South Africa, of course, we will be able to supply South Africa. We also, you know, every country where we we do a trial, we make sure the country is supplied um, because it's sort of part of, um, how would you call it? I mean, it's part of the way things are done. When you do a trial in a, in a country, you make sure they, do, they, they get supplied. But here anyway, we will be able to supply everybody. In terms of the data collection, yes, we will have data in every age group. When you do a, uh, when you develop a vaccine, you start with the, uh, LC adults, so this is people between age of 18 to 55. When you have enough data, then you start vaccinating people who are above 55. And later you go back and look at uh, children. That's a standard process. In that instance, um, you know, of course there will be uh, data in uh, children, but later. Mm. Uh, and there's not a big rush because as you know, children don't seem to be as much affected, but we will have a, uh, uh, data in either different age group in children in people with uh, health conditions you got to think about people who are for instance uh, on dialysis you know their their uh, their uh, immune system is not the same so you have to know whether the vaccine works in the specific population so you need to do all sorts of additional studies to demonstrate the efficacy in different uh, uh, populations and the, the, uh, an important point that um, a question was made, a question was asked is about prevention. Uh, what does a vaccine uh, do? And I should have covered this up front with your initial question, James. And another, another question that we will be studying, we're studying in the, in, the, in the trial, in the program is, does the vaccine, will the vaccine sterilize the virus? Mm -hmm. I, so basically completely eliminate the virus from, from your respiratory tract very quickly and therefore stop the, the spread. Or will the vaccine stop people from being sick, but you still carry the, the virus for a little while and you can contaminate others? If you look at flu, the flu vaccine doesn't protect everybody. And of those people who, who don't get uh, ill, some re remain carrier of the virus. Hmm. So we need all these answers and they will come out of the clinical program. And, and Pascal, I'm just, I'm just going to press you because I see that we've way run out of time, but just a final question, answer to Ludwig's question, which is, you know, would you have published this earlier and what do you now know about the patient? Yeah, so the, the, um, the, the publication, I mean, you, you know, we, we don't, when you conduct a clinical trial, you basically inform the regulators, the authorities, that's what you do, right? I mean, you don't go and publish, uh, make big announcements in the press. I mean, th this is a scientific process. And basically you don't hide anything. You just, uh, but you work with professionals, with the people who have the expertise and are, and are the regulators. So essentially you inform the regulators. So of course, immediately when we had the, the, the event, we, we paused the study 
we informed uh, the regulators in uh, in the countries in the various countries and we also informed all the other sites around the world to pause their study and inform their regulator right. so that's how you do it you inform the regulator you study you study the event and then you restart you don't that's go out and sort of major make a press a press announcements that's not the process Pascal, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off. As you can see, we could happily have this conversation all morning. We we have in the waiting room the former Prime Minister of Australia, the UN envoy for for youth, and uh, Jim O'Neill, one of the world's great uh, economists. Because our next session, which is going to be edited by my colleague Liz Mosley, is about whether or not we can respond to this pandemic with an eye to equality, the economic impact of it. So I'm afraid we're going to have to call an end to this. Can I say a huge thank you to you, Pascal? I appreciate how much uh, is on your plate, but actually coming here and helping us understand it gives us a, a, a really important platform for understanding what else can be done in the world this uh, in the course of the conversations today. So we can't afford you, but we can thank you, Pascal. Many I, I, I'm, I'm, my accent won't tell you this, but um, I'm an Australian citizen, so I won't keep uh, Julia, Julia Gillian with <laughs> Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Very good. Pascal, thank you very much. Have a good day. And please join us, everyone. In a couple of minutes, my colleague Liz Mosley is going to kick off on the next session. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's going to be, as I said, around economy and whether or not we can address the fundamental issues of inequality. Do join us in a couple of minutes. Pascal, thank you. Thank you.